After the first shots of the American Revolution were fired at Lexington and Concord on April 19, 1775, word quickly spread about the defeat of the British forces at the hands of the American Minutemen. This spurred around 20,000 militiamen to make their way to Massachusetts. Coming from the colonies of Rhode Island, Connecticut, and New Hampshire, this band of patriots was composed of men of all stripes, from the educated to the illiterate, refined gentlemen to the coarse and vulgar, white colonists and indigenous peoples, freedmen and even some enslaved. All had come anticipating that there would be further clashing with the British Army and began to lay siege on Boston. On June the 17th, 1775, these two forces would meet across the Charles River from Boston and Charlestown. Although this engagement would take place on Breed's Hill, it would be known by the name of another. Join us as we explore the Battle of Bunker Hill. By May of 1775, Boston was occupied by around 6,000 British soldiers commanded by General Thomas Gage. Colonial soldiers controlled access to the city through its occupation of the Boston Neck, which connected Boston to the mainland. This cut off the British from being able to launch operations against the colonial forces or to be resupplied by land. However, with British warships in Boston Harbor, the British garrison could keep itself supplied from the sea. When word reached England of the bloody encounters at Lexington and Concord, the British government sent additional troops, officers, and additional supplies to reinforce the Boston garrison. The reinforcements arrived on May 25, 1775, and included Generals Howell, Burgoyne, and Clinton. Meanwhile, American military leaders knew that if they could gain control of some of the high ground around Boston, they would have a strategic advantage over the British and drive the British Navy out of Boston Harbor. Choosing to occupy the Charlestown Peninsula north of Boston, the Americans would set the stage for the battle to come. British General Howe devised a plan to launch a surprise attack on Boston Neck and to seize Dorchester Heights. After fortifying the heights, the British would sweep the Americans out of Roxbury before occupying Charlestown, located on another peninsula to the north of Boston across the harbor. The British would then move to fortify the three hills overlooking Charlestown, which included Bunker Hill, Breed's Hill, and Moulton's Hill, then would make a final push that would drive the American militiamen out of Cambridge. Howe wanted the attack to take place on Sunday the 18th. He had anticipated that, due to the piety of the New Englanders, they would be attending religious services. Caught off guard, these Americans would not be ready for the British offensive. The British plan was finalized on June the 12th. However, within 24 hours, an informant was able to get Howe's plans into the hands of the Provincial Congress, the acting American government of Massachusetts. Now, with only five days until the planned British attack, the Provincial Congress decided that it was time to act. General Artemis Ward, commander of the ragtag New England Army, was ordered to construct additional fortifications. On June the 15th, General Ward sent a detachment of soldiers under the command of General Israel Putnam to occupy Charlestown and seize and fortify Bunker Hill, the tallest of the three hills on the peninsula. At around 6 p.m. on June 16th, approximately 1,000 colonial soldiers gathered in Cambridge, commanded by 49-year-old Colonel William Prescott. Soon, they were joined by around 200 men from Putnam's Regiment, led by Captain Thomas Knowlton, as well as a chief engineer of the Provincial Army, Colonel Richard Gridley. Colonel Gridley would oversee the construction of the fortifications on Bunker Hill. This band of colonial troops had no uniforms, but instead wore their homespun civilian clothes that some had been wearing for weeks. They carried muskets of all varieties that they had brought from their homes. After being given a day's rations and tools for digging trenches, Colonel Prescott led these 1,200 men out of Cambridge to Charlestown at around 9 p.m. 
When colonial forces arrived, for some reason, they chose to construct their fortification on Breed's Hill, which was lower than Bunker Hill, which strategically, for a defensible position, this made no sense. Perhaps the reasoning for this was because Breed's Hill was closer to Boston. Putnam and Prescott had been longing for a fight and the sight of American fortifications so visible and threatening to the ships in the harbor would provoke a British response. If this was the strategy, it worked. When the British awoke the next morning, they found the Americans had control of the high ground above Boston Harbor and would be able to open fire on their ships. The Royal Warship Lively, anchored in the harbor, opened fire on the American fortification and was joined by a British artillery battery situated on Copps Hill in Boston's north end. Most of the Americans had never been fired upon before and fear began to spread among them. Colonel Prescott did his best to calm his inexperienced army. Walking in front of his troops, he assured them that the British cannons were harmless at this range. Then, a British cannonball tore the head off of Asa Pollard, who had been working in front of the American redoubt. This caused several soldiers to flee their post. Prescott left atop the redoubt's parapet and, with the hopes of rallying his men, began walking back and forth, waving his hat as cannonballs whisked by. Taunting with shouts of, hit me if you can, at the British ships below, Prescott managed to inspire his men and give them the courage to continue preparing the hill for the upcoming fight. Across the harbor in Boston, General Gage was watching from his spyglass and he noticed a man yelling from the American works. Gage, passing the spyglass to an American loyalist named Abijan Willard, asked if he could identify him. Willard knew him and knew him well. It was his brother-in-law, William Prescott. Will he fight? Gage asked. Willard's answer was to the point. Yes, sir. He is an old soldier and he will fight as long as a drop of blood remains in his veins. Gage met with his generals to discuss a plan of attack. In the end, it was decided that the British would land on the southeastern corner of the Charlestown Peninsula near Bolton's Hill. General Howe would personally lead a major assault in an attack on the Americans' left flank, the most vulnerable point in their defenses. Then he would work his way around and attack them from the rear. Howe's second-in-command, Brigadier General Sir Robert Pigott, would simultaneously launch a diversionary frontal assault on the American redoubt. Major John Pickeron of the Royal Marines, who had recently won fame amongst his British officers but was despised by the colonists for his leadership at the Lexington and Concord battles, would lead the reserve force. Boston citizens watched from the rooftops as over 1,500 British soldiers were loaded into 18 barges and began to row across the Mystic River. To cover the soldiers' landing, British warships in the harbor intensified their bombardment. By 1 o'clock, the British forces landed uncontested by the Americans at Moulton's Hill. Howe realized upon closer observation that the colonial positions had been strengthened and the attack might not go as easily as he had planned. In the six hours that it took for the British to organize and make it across the Mystic River, the Americans had strengthened their works, including their left flank, which was now defended by Connecticut troops under Captain Knowlton. Howell's plans were further jeopardized by two New Hampshire regiments under Colonels John Stark and James Reed, who had arrived to reinforce the American position. Among the American reinforcements was Dr. Joseph Warren, the popular young president of the Provincial Congress. Dr. Warren, aside from Sam Adams, John Adams, and John Hancock, who were in Philadelphia attending the Second Continental Congress, was the most important patriot leader in Massachusetts. Warren, who was in line to be commissioned as a major general, chose to temporarily serve as an infantry private in order to not be left out of this fight. General Howe, noticing now that the Americans were constructing fortifications on Bunker Hill, decided to wait and request reinforcements from General Gage. By the time these reinforcements arrived, it was 3 p.m. The Americans were better prepared now than they would have been had General attacked when he initially landed. General Howe's troops began to get information for their assault against the Americans on Breed's Hill. Meanwhile, General Pigott's men came under fire from colonial sharpshooters who were sniping at him from within the town as they were forming up for their attack south of Charlestown. 
General Howe requested for Admiral Samuel Graves to help clear the rebels from their positions. Several exploding shells were fired from warships, and before long, hundreds of Charlestown's wooden buildings were engulfed in flames, sending citizens and militiamen fleeing. With Charlestown burning, the British soldiers began their advance. Howe's artillery that he had posted atop Moulton's Hill for covering fire was useless since the artillery men had brought the wrong size ammunition. To further add to the British problems, the hay on Breed's Hill had not yet been harvested. British soldiers were marching through waist-high grass and found themselves tripping over rocks and fences concealed by the brush. Howe's men moved against the Americans' left reinforced flank as Piggott led a diversionary attack against the redoubt. Several companies of British light infantry moved along a narrow beach at the bottom of a bluff, atop which was a rail fence being held by Captain Knowlton. The Redcoats hoped to make their way around Knowlton and the rail fence so they could flank the American position, but instead found themselves in the sights of Colonel John Stark's New Hampshire Regiment waiting behind their hastily built stone wall. The British infantrymen, forced into packed columns due to the narrowness of the beach, made easy targets when Colonel Stark ordered his men to open fire and the American volley was devastating. The Americans waited to the last possible moment to fire their weapons. Legend has it that one of their commanding officers, either William Prescott or Israel Putnam, told the men to hold their fire until they saw the whites of their eyes. The front of the British ranks crumpled to the ground like wheat before the scythe. The British officers continued to order their men forward despite the Americans' bullets' deadly work. After several minutes, the Redcoats withdrew, leaving behind 96 of their men dead on the beach. Meanwhile, on the higher ground to the west of where Colonel Stark and his men did their deadly work, General Howe's grenadiers continued their advance towards where Captain Knowlton and his men lie in wait. Here, too, at the rail fence, the Patriots waited for the British to come close before unleashing a deadly volley. The smoke, steep rocky hill, men falling lifeless to the ground, and the cries of the grievously wounded caused confusion in the British ranks. Stopped dead in their tracks, the grenadiers made easy pickings for the Americans, and the British officers who stood out due to their ornate uniforms were purposefully targeted. Howe's assault disintegrated, and his men were now making their way back down the hill. General Howe rallied his men for a second assault that ended just as disastrously as the first. An American soldier later recalled that the British began piling up bodies of their fallen comrades to take cover behind. Within 30 minutes of their second assault, the Grenadiers were once again in retreat. Pickett's attack on the redoubt would also fail. With his men's gunpowder running dangerously low, Colonel Prescott ordered them not to fire until the regulars were almost on top of them. The American volley was devastating, and Pigott's men, who had survived, broke into retreat. The British assaults had failed. With his aide-de-camp killed at his side and the sight of his men that he had led, dead or dying lying in the grass, General Howe found himself in an unfamiliar situation, possible defeat. Howe was not about to give up. He changed the objective, abandoning the assault on the rail fence and concentrated his remaining forces against the redoubt itself. Howe himself led the troops up the hill. His men sought to get revenge on the Americans that had laid waste to so many of their comrades. As this wave of Redcoats advanced, Prescott's men waited until the last possible second before unleashing their deadly volley. The Royal Marines took the brunt of the murderous fire, their Major John Pacarin among the dead, reportedly shot by a black soldier named Solomon. The Marines halted, but the Grenadiers pushed on, jumping into the redoubt. Prescott's men panicked and began to run, with at least 30 of them getting trapped. They were bayoneted to death by the Grenadiers. Dr. Joseph Warren was among the last to escape the redoubt, however he was caught a short distance away and killed with a shot to his face. His body was then ordered mutilated, hacked with bayonets by the vengeful British soldiers. Warren's death was considered a blow to the Patriot cause. Abigail Adams the next day would write to her husband, My bursting heart must find vent at my pen. I have just heard that our dear friend Dr. Warren is no more, but fell gloriously fighting for his country, saying better to die honorably in the field than ignominiously hanged upon the gallows. With the fall of the redoubt on Breed's Hill, what would become known as the Battle of Bunker Hill was over. 
The colonists retreated to General Putnam's position on Bunker Hill, then back across the Charlestown Neck to take up positions in Cambridge. The Americans had lost 115 dead and 305 wounded, with most of these casualties coming during those final moments of the frantic retreat from the redoubt. The British, however, despite winning this tactical victory, experienced heavier losses, with 226 British soldiers killed and 808 wounded, leaving the British casualty number at 1,054 or almost 50% of their entire force that was on the field that day, a large portion of these being officers. This would be the single bloodiest day in the entire war for the British Army. On July the 2nd, 1775, George Washington arrived in Cambridge and took command of this ragtag American force. He would later reorganize it into the Continental Army. The siege of Boston would continue until March 1776, when the British finally evacuated from the town. In the end, the Americans were able to look to the Battle of Bunker Hill as proof that they could effectively fight against British regulars and was another step towards America's Declaration of Independence. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe and share it with others. Also, if you'd like to learn more about the Battle of Bunker Hill, head on down to your local public or school library or check out the description box below for a link to the Boston National Historic Park. On behalf of the History and Heritage Explorers, I would like to say thank you and until next time, keep on exploring.